Welcome to section 7.2, where we're going to talk about the plasma membrane. Now the plasma membrane you might hear referred to by people such as myself as the cell membrane, which is a name that it's had for quite a long time. Uh, but we've changed it now and we use the term plasma membrane to try and make sure we're clear that this membrane that surrounds the cell, and you can see it kind of right here on the edge, this is the same type of membrane that you're gonna find inside the cell that many membrane-bound organelles possess. So there's not like some major fundamental difference between the membrane that's on the outside of the cell, the plasma or cell membrane, and those of the internal organelles if you're a eukaryotic cell that has internal organelles. Now the purpose of the plasma membrane is gonna to be to act as a boundary between what is outside the cell and what is inside the cell. And as such, it's critical that it is what's called selectively permeable. So you can see this term here, permeable means to pass through. So if it's selectively permeable, it only allows certain things in and certain things out. This is critical to make sure you get the nutrients that you need into the cell and the waste products that you produce out of the cell. But you don't want certain toxins, uh, you don't want certain waste to be able to continue getting into the cell too easily because they could cause problems and even cell death. So it's good to kind of have that more bouncer-like function from the cell membrane to make sure not just anybody gets in. So the fundamental basic part that we have of any plasma membrane is gonna be these phospholipids. And because phospholipids have this kind of head region that happens to have oxygens, that happens to be polar, that happens to like water, and then it's got these long fatty acid tails here that stick down, two of them per head because it's a phospholipid. These tails are nonpolar, they don't like water. So the way that they cope with not liking water is they will arrange themselves where the tails of two separate layers of phospholipids face each other. So because the tails face in, they're essentially like uh, if you're making a sandwich, that's where the cheese and the toppings are going to be, is in the middle. By facing each other, there is no water here in the middle, so they're happy. Whereas there is water that's going to be outside the cell, and there is water that's going to be inside the cell. And the heads, the part that's polar, faces the water, which it's fine with because that head region could care less if there's water. So this is a very stable arrangement for any type of lipid to kind of get into. So phospholipids are no stranger to this. They are gonna arrange themselves in this bilayer. And this is critical because substances that are too large can't get between the phospholipids to get inside. And substances that tend to be very charged, you know, like ions, they can't get through because this middle part, this hydrophobic part here in the middle, hates charge. So if something tries to get through that's charged, it gets repelled and it can't get past. So this is one way to kind of control what gets into and out of the cell. Things that are small tend to have an easier job of it, and things that are nonpolar or at least not big and polar can typically get through without too much difficulty. Now if we look at this fossil of a bilayer a little bit more in depth, I want to make sure that we're clear. So you can see here that we've got a whole bunch of the head regions, and we've got these on the outside and the inside, and we've got the two tails sticking in between. Now I want to make sure we're clear that there are different types of fatty acids. So you'll see some of these fatty acids appear to be fairly straight, and so those would be saturated, and some of them appear to bend pretty strongly, those would be unsaturated. And so if we go through and have unsaturated fatty acids, just keep in mind it tries to space out these lipids, and so it makes the membrane be more fluid. You know, it makes the membrane fl more flexible, it makes it easier for things to shift around. That's the benefit of unsaturated fatty acids. You see a lot of things that live in cold areas have lots of unsaturated fatty acids because the cold tends to make things become more dense. By having unsaturated fatty acids, you spread things out, which counteracts that. So there's a lot of benefits based upon where you live to have saturated versus unsaturated fatty acids. We've already talked about that this head here is going to be the polar part, which is facing water, so it's happy. Uh, and we've talked about the middle here is nonpolar, which is ultimately why it's not going to let a lot of things that are charged get through easily. So this is just kind of a more in-depth picture you'll see. Now we're going to start talking about some of this other stuff too though, because you can see it's not just a phospholipid bilayer. That's just the most basic part to which we're going to start adding pieces. So with the fluid mosaic model, this is kind of the description of not just the phospholipid bilayer, it's all the other stuff. Because scientists learned early on that besides the phospholipid bilayer, there's things like proteins that are part of this membrane. But they weren't sure how this exactly works. So what we have now is a pretty good idea where we have this basic phospholipid bilayer we've talked about, but then we've got these proteins that are stuck through it, 
This is what you see here. This would be an integral protein. And we've got some proteins that are stuck essentially to it. You know, so they're adhering to one side, but they're not going all the way through. You're also going to have carbohydrates, these red pieces that are sticking out. These are carbohydrates. They're a series of various monosaccharides. That's what each of these little you know, red dots is, is a monosaccharide. And so these will play a role for our cells. And then we have cholesterol, which is this yellow stuff that you see here. Uh, these will be cholesterols that are embedded as well and serve a vital function. You know, cholesterol gets a very bad rap, but cholesterol does serve a lot of very important functions in our bodies. And one of them is with membrane structure. So more in depth then. Membrane proteins, these guys do a bunch of stuff just like all proteins tend to do a bunch of stuff. So one of the functions is signal transmission, where a lot of these proteins can function as receptors. So there can be a molecule like a hormone that can bind to it and trigger a change that eventually gets sent through the cell and causes some response. That response could be growth. The response could be to activate certain genes to make cells go from not doing something to maybe producing melanin because you've been exposed to sunlight and so it makes you get a tan. You know, there's lots of different functions that can be triggered by this, but one of the key things is to act as a receptor so that it can receive signals and cause cellular change as a response to those signals. That's very important to maintain homeostasis and to develop. It'll also serve a vital transport function. You'll notice some of these proteins have like a channel within them. And if you're a charged molecule, for instance, like let's say potassium, K+, you can't get through this phospholipid bilayer because that middle hydrophobic nonpolar part hates you. And so instead what you do is you can go through specialized channels that allow K+, to pass through. Now you have lots and lots of different proteins, each of which, much like enzymes, tends to specialize in just letting one specific molecule get in. But these proteins can be vital to allow certain molecules that are perhaps a little bit too big or a little bit too polar or ionic to otherwise get through the phospholipid bilayer. And then lastly, they can function as support. Uh, you'll see some of these proteins are actually going to attach to other proteins that then connect to other cells. You know, they can connect to other tissues, uh, which allows things to be held in place. So your skin, for instance, is held in place by a bunch of proteins called collagen and elastin. And so this allows for it to maintain its integrity. You can also shift it and it goes back to where it was because the elastin kind of tugs it back. So this is due to all these proteins that are outside the cell membrane. So they're kind of in between cells that connect all these cells so they don't just kind of free float. You can't just wrap your skin around your arm over and over again. There's connections holding everything together. That's why your skin is solid. You know, you can't easily pull it apart is because there's proteins holding these cells together to give them the strength and durability that otherwise they wouldn't have. So a huge, huge benefit is going to be things like support. Now the carbohydrates, these guys have a fairly simple job. Their job is normally to communicate some piece of information. Uh, this is very critical when we talk about things like organ transplants because some of these carbohydrates that are attached will kind of convey messages about what your cell is. So it's kind of like an ID card. And so you have things like immune cells that are meant to patrol and make sure that whoever's there is supposed to be there. And they can kind of read a lot of these surface carbohydrates to analyze if this is a cell that is supposed to be there, if it's you, or if this is a foreign cell like a bacteria or a fungus. And if it's foreign, they'll typically attack and kill it. And so it's important we have the right communication pieces here. This is also why even if you give someone human tissue, like a kidney, in many cases, you can have rejection because the body can see that the other person has different carbohydrates and some of these other different molecules that signal who the cell is. And so it realizes it's not you. And so then you can go into organ rejection because your body starts to get, say, well, this thing's foreign. We're not supposed to have foreign things in the body, so I'm going to attack it. And so this is one of the reasons that people who get organ transplants typically also have to get medication to help prevent an immune response. So they take immunosuppressants. And immunosuppressants just keep their immune system from attacking these guys, even if it notices some minor differences with some of these surface carbohydrates or proteins that it's able to read to determine who it is. Now cholesterol, its main task, at least in our membranes, is going to be about fluidity because this kind of wedges in here in between the uh, phospholipids. And so because of that, it can help spread things out a little bit if it gets too cold. Uh, and if it gets too hot, by being kind of in between these phospholipids and by being nonpolar, 
it has a little bit extra attractive force. So even if these phospholipids start to pick up speed because it's getting hotter and they start to kind of bounce a little bit further away from each other and you have to start worrying about the actual phospholipid membrane rupturing because this whole phospholipid membrane, these phospholipids are constantly able to move. You know, they're not bonded in place. They're just attracted to each other because they hate water, you know, in this middle part. And these polar regions, like other polar regions, so they're attracted to each other. But it's just these weaker attractive forces. You know, it's more on the order of hydrogen bonds. It's not like covalent bonds. And so as these guys are jostling around and moving and they're nice and fluid like they're supposed to be, fluid mosaic, occasionally you'll have issues where it gets so hot that they can bounce so much they start to bust away from each other. And if your membrane develops any type of opening, the insides can now go out. And that, that's a problem. You know, that's not like acceptable. That means cell death. And so these cholesterols, by being in here, they kind of add to the mix. So even if you have something going on where these guys start to spread out, these cholesterols can be in between a lot of these phospholipids and still exerting that attractive force to try and help hold things together. So the phospholipids can get a little bit further apart and there's still something between them. That cholesterol is still between them, holding them, preventing them from completely splitting. So it allows membranes to stay a bit more fluid, a, a bit more safe, even at higher temperatures as well. So in extreme temperatures, cholesterols can help maintain the proper level of fluidity for a cell membrane. That's their purpose, at least in the membrane.